If I could have your attention, I would like to call the May 19th, 2016 meeting of the Forsyth County Board of Education to order. <coughs> First, we will have the welcome invocation and pledge with Ms. Nancy Roach, if everyone will rise. We gather tonight to make decisions for our community. May we use only our best skills and judgment, keeping ourselves impartial or neutral as we consider the merits and pitfalls of each matter that is placed before us, and always act in accordance with what is best for our community and our fellow citizens. Please salute and pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have before us an agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. A motion by Tom and a second by Kristen. All in favor? Unanimous. <coughs> First on our agenda, we have recognitions with Dr. Cindy Salome. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure. We have a, a obviously a lobby full of people, but it's my pleasure for our last recognitions of the night. And we are going to start with the 2016 Georgia FBLA State Leadership Conference winners. It's hard to organize a big group. Right there. Uh, I think maybe we've got it. No. Okay, think we're ready? Okay. Again, the 2016 Georgia FBLA State Leadership Conference winners. Their teacher is Susan Fagan. And one of them, Royce, which one's Royce? Royce is the state president of the Georgia FBLA. Would you please come forward, state your name and your school? Cheyenne Merchant, Lambert High School. See you to Jeff Lambert High School. Hunter Lee, Lambert High School. Uh, Lauren Mattingly, Lambert High School. Molly Williams, Lambert High School. Mackenzie Morrissey, Lambert High School. Louis <laughs> Dickerson, Lambert High School. Just a little extra. Would you all give them a round of applause? <laughs> supporters in the back. Uh, would you, everybody who's supporting our group, would you please stand or wave at us if you're already standing in the back? And we can congratulate you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> congratulations. Next, we have the Georgia National History Day competition. Out with one and in with another one, I hope. Good job, Is this Georgia National History Day competition group? Great. Come right here. I wanted to tell you that they are going to compete. They're from South Forsyth High School. They're going to compete in Baltimore this summer. And their documentary is entitled, Salt, Seasoning Global Relations. Please tell them your name. Uh, my name is Abigail Brucker. I'm Shivani Bugat. Hi, I'm Katie Renes-Lossus. Hi, I'm Jenny Joy. Those of you who are in support, I, I think you're standing in the back. Would you please wave and let us congratulate you. Next we have Brady Hutchinson. Brady's right here. 
He is from Days Creek Elementary. He is a Georgia Social Studies Fair winner, and his project was entitled, What is Child Labor's Effect on the Economy? Tegan Bombert is his teacher. Congratulations. <laughs> Are his parents here tonight? Yeah. Yay, okay, thank you for being here. Okay, I think we're now ready for the Georgia Science and Engineering Fair, fair winners. It's marvelous that we have so many. We may have to get an auditorium or something bigger <laughs> for these awards. Congratulations. Science and engineering? Uh -huh. Everybody have a chance to get in because they want to see this. These are the 2016 Georgia Science and Engineer Engineering Fair winners. Please tell us your name and your school. Katie Jordan, North Forsyth High School. Nevada oh. <laughs> Shanmugam, South Forsyth High School. Elena Dawes, West Forsyth High School. Sudan Chitgopkar, South Forsyth High School. Christian Weimer, Piney Grove Middle School. Hannah Walker, Forsyth Central High School. Keegan Householder, Forsyth Central High School. Kidari, South Forsyth High School. Anish Pikmo, South Forsyth High School. Arjun Kano, South Forsyth High School. Holden Schaefer, West Forsyth High School. Jenny Choi, South Forsyth High School. Shavani Bagat, South Forsyth High School. Will you please give him a round of applause? <laughs> Those of you who are here in support of our wonderful students, would you please wave at us because I think you're standing. We want to thank you for being here too. Thank you all. We are now on to the VEX World Championship. <laughs> the one? Have I missed one? What was that? Were they trying to tell me? Have I missed something? about our VEX World Champions. They went to the international cha uh, competition in April, <laughs> April 20th and 23rd in Louisville, Kentucky. The Lakeside Middle School group is called Killer Monkeys Team, number 7268A. Their teachers are Zach B Burning and Emil Decker, Decker. Excuse me, Emil, I didn't say your name right, Decker. They won awards in the, uh, for middle school excellence, Middle School Programming Skills Challenge, and they are the world champion in that, and evidently that's a very big honor. And they are the Middle School Robot Skills Challenge, and they place second place in that. So I'm gonna let them tell you their names. Hi, I'm Sophia Tran. I'm Michael Wynn. I'm Nitu Bogorajan. Pranav Gonkodi. I'm Nathan Yam. I'm Rohan Aluri. <laughs> Those of you in support, will you wave if you're supporting that group? Thank you. Did 
Did I do the South Middle? I didn't do South Middle, did I? The South Middle's not here? The South Middle School team named Electric Eagles were a division finalist, and they tied for third in the world, and their teacher is Tom Burks. Now the East Cyber, East Cyber Mission National finalists. Those are up next. I want to tell you a little bit about the East Cyber Mission National Finalist Team. This is from Forsyth Central High School. Uh, this award is sponsored by the U.S. Army, and it's designed to encourage students grades 6 through 9 to develop solutions to real-world problems in their local communities. Their project was based on fertilizer runoff in bodies of water. Each one of them received a $2,000 savings bond. So let's give them a round of applause. Tangi. Alex Yates. Thank you. Samuel Dong. Thank you. Those of you in support, if you were way back there. <laughs> and now we have our musical theater award. Just you? They didn't show. Oh, are we are we ready, Kelly? Do we have anybody else for the musical theater? It's just the teacher. Just the teacher. All right. All right. Tell them who you are, and I'll tell them about the award. Eric Gray. Eric Gray, and he is representing all his kids for all all the children. Uh, Eric and Kurt and Olivia Morris, I think, are the three of you. Well, I'm from West and uh, the other two from South. South. Right. So the Georgia High School Musical Theater Schuler Hensley Award winners, and that those this award is based on Broadway's Tony Awards for Excellence in High School Musical Theater. Congratulations. <laughs> And that concludes our awards for tonight. And now we're going to turn it over for the Superior Performance Spotlight to Matt Elementary School for their Adventure Challenge. Charlie Stalder is the principal, and Debbie Connerelli will be organizing the group tonight. And Susan. OK. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be here. We just want to tell you we are Googlers, so it's going to take just a minute to pull up our Google uh, presentation. The first thing I'd like to do is introduce our students, uh, Noah Holloman, Cody Van Buren, um, Alex Smith, Ava Miller, Brooke Miser, and Ellie Holmes. And I'd also to like to acknowledge their parents who are in the audience because we could not have accomplished what we did without their incredible support. And this is my colleague, Suzanne Clark.
said this way. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> did you want to introduce the kids at all? I already did. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Suzanne Clark. I'm just, uh, we have found something new today within Google Drive. Uh, so if you have any questions, you're welcome to use uh, Google, the URL at the top of the screen so we can respond to your questions. Okay. Uh, what is the Georgia Tech um, Adventure Challenge? Well, it's something that was created by Georgia Tech in uh, 2009, and it was organized by their faculty. The competition brings together students, innovators from all academic backgrounds uh, across the campus in an effort to foster creativity, invention, and entrepreneurship. It's partnered with uh, the Georgia Public Broadcasting and transforms an ordinary invention contest to an electrifying television contest. And what does that mean to us? Um, well, it's American Isle for nerds. <laughs> 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 it's an interdisciplinary uh, competition open to undergraduates and recent graduates, and this is the first year they've opened it um, to K-12. Up until that time, it's open to the high school level, and I believe middle school as well. For South County, it's fortunate to have a world-class engineering background um, up with Georgia Tech in our backyard, and we are so happy to be part of their program. Uh, you can click for me okay, if you want to send it. And also we are, uh, appreciate uh, our neighboring county, Cobb County, who has shared all of their lesson plans with us at the elementary level. I, Matt Elementary is the first elementary school to participate. I believe we're the first Forsyth County school to participate. So here we are getting trained at the Invention, Invention Studio in September. And this is what attracted to us to this competition. One, Genius Hour, which is personalized learning at its best because it's totally driven by the student and their passion and interest, and we do that once a week with our students. Also, the engineering piece of STEM and that teaching them that process. Another element is empathy, which was a section of the lessons, and it's very important to teach our kids to empathize with others, to help them solve problems, and to get, create solutions to problems that other people have, what their needs might be. And finally, Shark Tank, the entrepreneurial X aspect, because our kids are learning how to market, and they're getting a sense of business, and what sells in the marketplace. This is a quote you see often associated with Genius Hour. It says, you are a genius in the world, uh, needs your contribution, but also expects it, enjoys it, loves, and appreciates it. So after the training that we had in August, we kicked off the program with 30 lessons, and uh, the kids loved it. Uh, we were able to um, implement various empathy elements into the problem solving challenges that they were presented with to, to model what they would be doing with their own challenges. Uh, and we had our own competition. This is at the competition that we had on in February at Matt Elementary School. These are some of the kids and their products and everything was produced at school using Google Drive in terms of the research, the surveys, the forms, all aspects. So it was collaboration really at its best. Um, these are some more examples of the students' work from the day. We had three judges. Two of the judges from, were from um, a local engineering firm, Pumping Solutions, within Forsyth County. The other uh, judge was an uh, employee of Kimberly Clark. We, uh, in the middle picture, those are third graders. They applied through a Google Doc <laughs> to be a student ambassador uh, and lead people through as guides as for our um, competition. Um, we also had all the other classes within the school system attend as many as we could uh, during that day challenge. This is just a snippet from our welcome video at Matt. But it will show welcome to an adventure challenge at Matt Elementary. One tire center. This is organized by sponsored by Georgia Tech. Here's an example of one of our boards. Freeze our with 25 projects. It's a combination of invention convention and shark tank in which all the students created an individual pitch on iMovie or um, as a via scope and created a movie to solve a product. Thanks for visiting Matt Elementary. Hope to see you soon. Okay. And now we invite
invite the boys to come up and talk to you about their project. We're just going to show you their pitch video, which was originally shot at Matt, but then we enlisted the help of West Forsyth. I have a connection there. Um, with the <laughs> studio, and this is their pitch video, which we'll show you, and then they'll tell you a little bit about their product. Sorry. Oh, I can't stand my papers falling out of my folders. What did you say? I can't stand my papers falling out of my folders. We'll try the simple magnet folder. It uses magnets to seal the stuff so papers don't fall out. See? <laughs> they come in different colors, like yellow, red, blue, and purple. Wow, that sounds amazing. And they stick together. Wow, that's so cool. Hey, where can I buy one? You can get it at your school store or your local stores. Wow, I'll totally buy one. Buy the simple magnet folder! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> that's a good idea. Okay. Come on over, guys. Go for it. Gotta go fast. Just first. I continuously have this problem every day with my papers falling out. I had it happen yesterday with my agenda folder. <laughs> it, it, it happens all the time. It's sad. Of course, naturally. We introduced the product to the judges, and they were impressed that we were one of few that had working prototype. I'm Noah, and we used. Google Docs to create most of these with, with you can um, go on real life time together like so let's say if Alex and we we're going we can go on the same time but we have to be on different computers. Okay. Right. We um a gifted class did a um, thing called What Bugs Me at the start of the year, where we would toss ideas of um, things that annoy us every day. Okay. To find our solution to our uh, everyday problem, we continuously thought about the solution for our folders. Then it hit, then it hit us. We could use magnets on each side to seal the, ma to seal the magnet. We went through many different designs for our prototype we came out with. Zip, this one, and it uses two very lightweight magnets to seal the papers together. Thank you, guys. You can have a seat, and we'll bring our girls up. Good, sir. Come on, girls. This is our girls' pitch. Oh, sorry. Uh, did this really happen again? Ava, do you have an extra eraser? No, not today. Mine broke too. Well, now I have a solution for both of you. Introducing the new finger eraser. All you have to do is put it on your finger, and poof, your eraser breaking days are O V E R over. <laughs> I want the one that's purple with chevron stripes. I want the one that looks like a watermelon. This really makes it easier to raise my troubles. And for a low, low price of $1.99, you can get your own finger eraser. It also comes with different patterns, shapes, scents, and colors. Wow, this is cheap. It smells great. I'm definitely going to go to the store to buy these. Me too. Finger erasers. <laughs> So how we made the video was we went to West Forsyth High School and John White, a teacher there, helped us film the video and it took a lot of times to make it like sort of perfect. <laughs> <laughs> before, the video that we made before, it was very unprofessional and you could like barely hear us and we made it like in the hallway at school and so, yeah. <laughs> As you saw in the video, we daily have the problems with our eraser breaking off our pencil. 
we created the finger eraser. The finger eraser is made out of eraser clay. To make it smell great, we rubbed essential oils all over the prototype. If we ever make uh, the finger eraser in the future, we will use the manufacturing process. And the manufacturing process is where we put hot plastic into this mold, and this is just a, uh, a prototype of one. And we would put the hot plastic into the mold, and this would be the finger eraser, and we'd break that off, and then we have the finger eraser. And these are the prototypes of the finger eraser. So we were very excited when we won the Iron Cat Award. We won a mini iPad, a portfolio, and yeah. So we were very excited when we won that stuff. <laughs> Iron Cat is a program in which on a computer, using the program, you can create 3D, design, 3D shapes and print them off of a 3D computer. And this concludes our presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let me just say that if I was a shark, I would buy into those inventions. <laughs> those are great ideas. <laughs> we really want to thank uh, Ms. Taller and Ms. Barnes for helping us and allowing us to do uh, different resources and challenges like this with our children through the resource model that we have at Mount Elementary, Mount Elementary School. So you're going to keep you. Debbie, you are continuing to do this, are you not? You're going to yes. continue. Oh, wait, okay. just wait until next week. Are there different <laughs> steps? <laughs> <laughs> they, they won an award. Um, is they, they, yes, they, they represented, in a, represented us at the state level. Okay. And then the girls received a special recognition <coughs> for the their Iron Cat uh, right. program use. Good. Okay. So. Right. Yeah, it's well, good. Over all awesome. Noah, yes. great you. too. Thank you. Very good job. Thank you. Mm -hmm. good yeah. good. Did, did you say best in the state K twelve mm -hmm. for, for the iron, iron for the use of the iron cat? Wow. Yes. Elementary best of that. That's, That's pretty good. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you so much. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Awesome. Wow. So we need to get you back. That is cool. Yeah. At this time, we'll take a couple of minutes break, and if someone, if you want to go, you can. If you want to stay for the rest of our business part of our meeting, you're welcome to do that. It doesn't get any more exciting. Than what you That's right. Exactly. It's downhill from here, but you're welcome to go. Okay, we'll call the meeting back to order now that we have the usual suspects here. <laughs> <laughs> we have before us a consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. A motion by Tom and a second by Nancy. All in favor? Unanimous. Next, public participation. No public participation, so we move on to presentation and discussion items. And first is Mr. Rick Gunn with the finance report. Yeah, that's a hard act to follow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. But this is exciting. I'm stuff. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I need to have music or something playing with it. <laughs> Okay, well the first item I have tonight is our monthly board reports. And our first report for the month of April is our cash receipts and disbursements. Uh, beginning of the month we had $82.9 million and we received $21.4 million, dispersing $30,500,000, leaving us a balance of $73,800,000, which is about $11 million over where we were this time last year. And that's attributable to the increase in the millage rate. Mm -hmm. So that's the funds that it generated. Our year to, year to date budget as of May 3rd, excuse me, April 30th, uh, revenues were at 90.5% and expenditures 83.27. And we should be at 83.33. So we're right in line with where we should be. Uh, of course, our largest functional area is instruction, and we're at 82.83%. And as you scroll through, uh, there's our revenues. Um, we will make a revenue number this year. And then below that, there is a breakout for each individual account within each functional area. Okay, next we have checks for the month. Come on, here we go. Uh, we issued 805 checks this month, checks and wires. Get down to the bottom here. For a total of 17700000 
all of our schools sent their financial report, reports in for the month. And our ending balance for our schools is 8347000 Our debt service cash analysis, we began the month with $51,052,000. Revenues of 3300000 $3, And expenses of $850,000, uh, leaving us a balance available for debt services of $54.4 million. Our investment summary for the month of April. Um, in the column you see for 307, that's the fund for the 2014 and 16 bonds. We drew out $11 million, leaving us a balance of $116,300,000. In SPAS 4, for the month we received $3,043,000, leaving a balance of $46,900,000. And our SPAS 4 comparison, of course, my columns did not open correctly. Open those up a little bit more. Uh, for this month, we collected three million forty-three thousand, and to date, since August of 2012, we've collected one hundred and twenty-three million six thousand for the spots four. We always expect the bump in, in January after the you know the December collection of the holidays. Mm -hmm. Any idea why we had a big bump this time? It's, so, it's really big. Well, it's a great bump, but you know when you look at the um, at the previous year. Um, it's, we're so hit and miss each month. One month is down 21% when you compare it to the previous year, then it's down another 3%, but then in January we were up 17% from the previous year. So it's just, mm -hmm. a, just there is no <laughs> constant April, line. Next April to go maybe down with spring break and people being out of town and buying less here, so it'll be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what May looks like this time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But March, just wasn't right, yeah, right. no idea. Yeah, it's just like a bouncing ball. Each month, you have honestly, you have no idea what you're going to take in. Could be weather because we had a milder March than we used yeah. to do. That's, that's what true I'm too. That's yeah. true too. And April that's was true. horrible. So okay. Yeah. That's a good point. Okay. Any questions on the financial reports for the month? Mm -hmm. I'm still and up. You're next. I'm still You're up. Still up. Okay. Spouse resolution. Spouse resolution. Okay. Um, um, myself and Dr. Bird and Jennifer Caracciolo, um have spent some time going over uh, the possibilities of what we can do with the next spouse when it renews. Um, the current one is currently paying uh, several debt service issues, and we were talking about continuing that trend. Um, and I'll show you. This is currently all of our debt issues that we have. Um, we have a 92, an 11, 07, 04, um, so on and so on. You can see the maturity dates on these. Uh, we have two that will be dropping off July of this year. Um, and then we have, uh, you can see the dates that they're uh, ending on, uh, another one June of 17, another one February of 2019. Uh, the current payment sources for those are listed as well. Um, and in the proposed payment source column, the changes that we have, um, the SPLAST will pay the last two payments of the 2011 bond issue. It would pick up the 2014 bond issue and pay a portion of the new 2016 bond issue. It's kind of like I, I likened it to gerrymandering our debt service payment schedule. We were trying to get to around $160 million worth of debt retirement, leaving about $35 million for pay-as-you-go projects, land, um, as, as needed. And I mean, this is definitely... Uh, changeable. We were just trying to come up with the best scenario to um, get rid of as much debt as we possibly could using the SPAS funds. Uh, now one thing I will note on this, once the 2004 is paid off, um, after February, 19, February 1st of 2019, we'll have about $15 million a year, which is freed up in our m and debt service, which can be used for future bond issues if the board decided to do that. So in doing this, we're basically moving one whole bond issue, being the 2014, over to the SPLOST. And uh, so when you, look at, when you look at our debt service schedule, there's a little piece here, and a big chunk here, and a big chunk here, and another little chunk over here. So that's why I call it gerrymandering. It's kind of grabbing from all different places, trying to maximize the use of it. Um, the remaining $35 million will start becoming available. I believe it was at the end of the third year we would start seeing those funds. To, to be available for other purchases other than debt. 
for the three years. Uh, the three, yeah, three years pass after the SPLOS is passed and starts. Yes. Into the third yes. year into the SPLOS. Into the third year. So and the 1920? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So anyway, we, we're not going to be asking you to, to vote on a uh, resolution until June. We wanted you to have a chance to kind of think about mm -hmm. this and digest it a little bit. Yeah. But as we yeah. considered uh, how we might use SPLOS, since we have <coughs> taken care of a number of needs in our community um, through all the projects we've been doing, we really thought, the three of us, that probably the best use for the most amount of the SPLOS was to pay down some of the debt yeah. to put us in really good financial uh, uh, situation for, for the future. Um, we, know, we know we're going to be building more schools in the future. We know we're going to need some money for some land purchases. That's why, as Rick pointed out, that um, we're allocating some of it for that, whatever the board decides to do. But we thought that, w in our opinion, we thought that might be the best use. We wanted to present it to you tonight, let you talk about it tonight, think about it, and then bring it back in June for a vote. Well, I think uh, I think your your choice of using it to buy land is extremely important. With our conversation last week about talking about what we're going to look like in the future, how can we plan for that time, that's the one thing that we can work on and do now. That even if we bought the land and the whole scenario of schools changed, we still have that, that investment that we could sell if we needed to. But you look at the high schools, I would never have ever thought we'd be building another high school in the south end of the county, and we did. And we've got land now for one more after, the, after Denmark, right. but there's going to definitely be a need for one or two more high schools, even after the Alliance Academy. Yeah. That's just talking high schools. So yeah. If we grow like the population is going to be growing and we end up having 90,000 kids, which I don't think will happen, but it could, we need the land to build the schools. Yeah. So I think that's a great idea. Well, the yeah. nice thing, too, is, is looking at our schedule, we have three that will drop off within the next year. Right. right. That's really good. So mm -hmm. That's what made the 2014 bond affordable for us, because those mm -hmm. rolling off, right. they were able to take yes. that on and, and still stay at the same rate. Right. right. And, and again, for marketing purposes, when we put this out to our community, making sure our community understands we're using sales tax, sales tax dollars to pay down debt versus property tax right. dollars, right. I think, is, right. uh, is, is an, an easy, I won't say easy, uh, an easier marketing uh, campaign. Well, it's one reason we've been able to keep our millage rate That's correct. low That's to, uh, right. because of that. But That's I think right. the focus is now on that 70% of the tax money comes from the residents. Mm -hmm. and so that's getting a lot of attention right now in the strategic planning the county's doing. So I think you will see that change as town centers are created. Mm -hmm. The splash revenue will definitely come up, so this is the right way to head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also have the, the schedule of all the debt, so if you'd like to sit down and see exactly which payments are coming from where and when, happy to do that with you. Well, I want to thank you and, of course, Dan. Like both of you all for years have been able to do this for us, and it's... It's really company to know that y'all are great at balancing the act. Uh, the sad part is I remember the 1992 bond issue. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 issued. So I think think about it. You know, feel free to call and ask mm -hmm. any questions. Give us your comments, and then we'll put this back up for the for the June meeting, and we'll have the well, there there's yes. the sample ballot question. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been working with Ken Pollock, uh, who's uh, who's been our bond counsel for years, as well as our underwriters and. After determining which blocks of debt we were focusing on, um, this is what it would look like. I won't read it to you, but um, basically it's identifying those specific areas of each bond issue um, for a total of 159,471,000 in debt. And again, we came up with a total of uh, approximately 195 million based on current receipts and projections and things like that. Mm -hmm. So wonder where that no number five, came from. Five years, right? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And as you know, you, you once you reach that, you can't collect anymore. So you have to be very strategic sure. about what you put. Yes. That's true. That's, that's, yeah. We're just about at that point. At the rate we're coming in now. You, you, proje you projected if things were the same, we'd be 187, 188. About 183. Yeah. And okay. 83, 85. So we left some room for some growth. Right, because we are, I mean, just over the last few years, we have right. really... Right, right, and then, well, and, and even taking the projection from the last two years and projecting that with a 3% growth, that was the 183 to 5 million that I came up with. Right. Um, and they were, you know, my bond underwriters were saying, well, you know, I, I would only do it at one, 
but again, it's you don't know what it's going to be in a year sure. from now. Well, if the population um, continues to grow. Well, that's right. Right. The and that's right. So, um, so that's basically a sample of the ballot question. Of course, if we change it, would we would you know, he he would change it for us. Uh, the next meeting would be the actual resolution that you would see. Any questions on that? Yeah. Okay. Looks good. Okay, next we have Mr. Carl Mercer with the 2014-15 CCRPI results. Dr. Beard, members of the board, always a pleasure to be here to uh, talk about results uh, in Forsyth County. As we go through this, you're going to see, I mean, obviously we had a lot of awards tonight it shows uh, in our results and the hard work that all of our schools are doing. I wanted to go over the, the calculations of 1415. Of course, been very um, intentional uh, with the media and everybody that we talk with that you cannot compare 2012 through 2014 CCRPI, CCRPI results to 2015. Uh, as you can see, I've listed some of the new additions and some of the changes. We have new content weights. Of course, the three big portions of uh, CCRPI are achievement, progress, and achievement gap. <coughs> achievement went from 60% to 50%, progress from 25% to 40%, and achievement gap from 15 to 10. So you see there's quite a change in the calculations there. We also have new benchmarks. Uh, there are several indicators that are benchmarked at the 95th percentile because they know that achieving 100% is highly unlikely. Those have been recalibrated. Uh, we also have new indicators. Uh, the attendance indicator is different. We also have a couple indicators that were combined uh, to keep the redundancy of the results. Um, and we also have new assessments. We have our Georgia milestones. And so with the milestones, we have four performance levels instead of three, and so the calculations of those, those three levels are different as well. So I will start off with the uh, district uh, results here. You can see that I have uh, Forsyth County versus Georgia, the average score, and you can see that at all, four, at, at all three levels and at the district level, uh, we are uh, above the, the average uh, by a large portion. Um, I will note that uh, and I talk about this later in the slide, but 91.8, the district um, average, is highest in the state. So very proud of the, as, as I said, the hard work that our school staff and teachers. Looking at the elementary level, you can see that I've lined out the uh, elementary schools there. That red bar represents the state average of 76, and all of our schools are above that average, uh, some by uh, over 30 points. At the middle school, uh, I've got the red bar set at a 71.2, which is the uh, state and middle school average. And again, you can see that we have uh, all of our schools above that average. And you'll notice that some of those scores are over 100% because we do have one, we have 10 extra points on that CCRPI that you can uh, gain above and beyond. But the way that the calculations are, you can gain above 100% uh, of the points in the achievement portion because the distinguished level is actually worth one and a half points. So theoretically, if you, if you had 100% of your students in the distinguished, you get 150% of those points, which pushes you above that 10 that they have for that section. Uh, and again, at the high school level, all of our schools are above the uh, state average. Um, we've got a, 90, a high of 97.1 for South Forsyth and then also 95 for Lambert High School. And that red bar is at uh, state average of 75.8. So just some kind of overall highlights for the district. Our top, we had the top district score in the state at 91.8. We had very strong overall performance in math district-wide. Um, I think that goes back to a lot of the emphasis that we've had on math because math was really the first one that, uh, that we moved over to that, uh, uh, the, the new, t new type of assessment with that coordinate algebra and we, we saw that we did have a dip and we put a lot of hard work into that and those other areas we're starting to see those move up um, and we'll also see that uh, with all the hard work that we're putting into the others as we move along. Uh, strong overall score for progress, which is progress is your student growth percentiles uh, and also achievement gap in math. And what that tells me is not only are we uh, 
pushing all of our students at all levels. We're pushing our high level and our low level students, but we're also making progress on uh, shrinking that gap between our lowest 25% and the state mean. Elementary school, uh, we have the top average score in the state, 92.3. You'll see that Dave's Creek, Big Creek, Johns Creek, Brookwood, and Sellers Bridge were all in that top 10 uh, of the elementary school state scores. Middle school, we had the top average school in the state, 91.1. Uh, you'll see that South Forsyth Middle School, Victory Creek Middle School, Riverwatch Middle School were in that top 10 of the middle school state scores. And at the high school level, we had South Forsyth High School at number four and Lambert High School at number 10 when you looked at um, all of the scores uh, in the top 10 high school scores in the state. So again, a lot of hard work, very proud of our schools, proud of our students, teachers, principals, everything. Everybody, we can see that all the hard work that we're putting in is paying off. Uh, just a couple points of information. So what do we do? Uh, yes, we get the results. Um, we get data, but we also want to use that data. We want to analyze it and use it. And so we've got an anal uh, analysis worksheet that's available for the school and the district. Uh, this worksheet allows them to put in their numbers from CCRPI, and then they can see the overall effect of each individual indicator so that they can pick their big, biggest areas of needs and work on those needs. Uh, they can also look at the areas that they're doing well uh, because we do, uh, we have a big emphasis on collaboration and district-wide collaboration and if one school is excelling in one area that other school needs to improve in those schools can get together and they can talk and I try to get as much information out to them as I can so that they can see those results to make that make that communication easier we review the results for school improvement that's a big part of a school improvement plan uh, all, I, I spent a lot of my time going out and uh, meeting with schools and administrators and we look at the CCRPI, we look at school improvement and we see how that ties in with what they're doing and look back and see, can we see the successes, the programs that you have in place? Do we see that evidence of what you're doing? Uh, the 15-16 CCRPI results, that's this year. 15-16 will be the baseline to our strategic waivers. Our new uh, contract started this year and this is our baseline year. Uh, any of the results system statewide, you can uh, find at the, uh, the link there to the Georgia Department of Education CCRPI website. They've got everything from 2012 to 2015. Uh, they also have it uh, broken out by component level, so you can look at the three, those three big areas that I was talking about. Questions? I have one, Carl. In uh, relation to the, the math scores and how well we did across the county, um, there has been a lot of pushback about the new way, the way that, that kids are being taught math now, and quite frankly, it doesn't make sense to me either. Mm -hmm. But I just wonder if the fact that we did, were able to uh, get the, the um, were able to teach that well and went, went against the grain, so to speak, that is, do you feel like these test scores are a reflection that maybe that is the correct way to be te teaching math? Or am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> uh, so I think that we do a really good job with instruction in our schools. We, we, we're out in the schools all the time. We see what they're doing. Um, Aaron Zitka and Kelly Price in, the, in curriculum working with Matt and, and Brian, uh, working with uh, uh, working with the math and working with what the instructional what, what the instructional strategies look like, uh, we've had the, the focuses on the data teams and when they uh, when we started the new assessment system, we knew it was going to be more rigorous. It's going to be higher DOK level, and it was mm -hmm. going to raise the ceiling. And what, what I felt like is that that's going to allow us to really outperform, allow us to perform higher because if the ceiling is only at a certain height. Mm -hmm. You can only go so high, but if you raise that by making it more rigorous, putting higher DOK levels on, we're allowed to show more, show, show more of what we, we can do as a system. So it paid off. Yeah. Okay. So years ago, it was math that we saw was something we wanted to work on. Is it too soon to have an idea of what maybe our next target is going to be? Well, some of the things that, uh, of course, that's always, we also, we always want to look at where we're doing well, but we also want to look at where we have to, uh, to work. Um, as, a, uh, as a system, I would say that ELA and science are probably two areas that we need to, to work on. Um, looking at the, uh, 
the progress score and gap achievement. So those are some areas that we'll be focusing on. Uh, I know that uh, this year, I think I mentioned earlier when we did the Georgia Milestones results that we do have a district-wide physical science uh, data team that's working. Um, teachers are getting together, they're talking about instruction, they're talking about data and what they need to do best for kids. All righty. You're Always still working right now with the advanced accreditation. All right, so uh, I think we mentioned earlier um, a couple uh, a couple uh, board meetings ago. We talked about the advanced ed timeline and when that when that was coming up. So I put together a little overview for you in the timeline. One of the pieces um, I, I had the opportunity to go to Columbia County uh, and well, I was a part of their external review uh, as advanced ed, and so I was able to see it from the outside and to see and hear and be a part of those conversations. Uh, also connected me with a lot of people across the state where we could talk about if you had it to do over again, what would you do? Uh, one of the pieces that came up was the professional development, making sure that everybody has access to understand what the process is about, why we're going through it, uh, and specifics about self-assessment and the standards. One thing that's helped us is going through the GAPS pro process. All of our schools have been through many GAPS and GAPS, and they've, uh, they've looked at standards, and they've assessed themselves and where they're at, and they've found evidence to pr uh, provide evidence for those ratings of the standards. So we're going to put together three pieces of professional development, advanced ed basics, that all staff are going to look at and be a part of, and it's going to be uh, uh, kind of an online class where you can go in and just learn about advanced ed and the basics of it and what's the expectation and why we're doing that. We're well, then also going to have a self-assessment professional development piece. And with that piece, that's really going to focus on looking at a standard, looking at a rubric and determining how I rate myself on that rubric. What determines a two and a three and a three from a four. And then we're also going to have a, a little bit of a training on an Elliott, which is Effective Learning Environments Observation Tool. That is the uh, tool that Advanced Ed uses when they come in to uh, observe the school. So we have a TAPS process that we look at when we're observing, but the Elliott really focuses on the student and student engagement during class. We we'll also have some stakeholder f uh, surveys uh, that we'll have to give for the students, teachers, and uh, parents. We'll, this, we'll then uh, have to form some self-assessment committees, and these self-assessment committees will have a focus of each standard, one through five, and then also a uh, student performance diagnostic, and then also a student's uh, a survey diagnostic where they'll analyze those results. All of the uh, all of the standard committees will have to collect evidence uh, based on their ratings, and they want to collect evidence that, um, that backs their rating, that shows evidence of that two or that three or that four. Uh, we'll also have to create committee summaries uh, at the district and school level, uh, and then at the very end, we'll post a review team. So on the next couple slides, um, I'll get to the timeline here in a second, but one of the things that we provided for the schools to help them, if we've provided the courses that we're going to create in its learning for them to upload their evidence and upload their pieces, uh, we've had, we have that professional development that I talked about. We're going to provide executive summaries for the schools. Uh, we're going to provide examples of evidence and also examples of standard narratives and summaries that will be required. We'll have ag agendas and directions for self-assessment committee meetings so that when they get together, they can be very efficient with their time. And then also we'll provide overall district support and guidance during the whole process. Uh, in May through August, a couple of next slides have our timeline. Uh, in May, we'll just kind of be uh, reviewing some feedback from, uh, I presented an admin meeting. We'll finalize the schedule. May and July, we'll be creating those professional development pieces. July 21st and 22nd is when it really kicks off. We'll have at our leadership summit, we'll provide training for that advanced ed basics and the self-assessment professional development. And we'll also go over the final timeline and some other pieces of information. The premise of the timeline is to get everything done at the school in August, get everything done at the district level in September, and then have October and November to kind of tie up some loose ends and get the documentation down. So you can see that August there, we've got the schools um, uh, getting ready for, to re-deliver that advanced ed basics. Uh, they're, um, 
they're, they're forming their committees, they're giving their professional development and really getting ready. In September, uh, they're collecting their evidence, uh, they're finalizing their pieces in, in the platform uh, that Advance Ed has, and then at, in September, the district starts up with their self-assessment committees as well. In October, the district is, is getting those pieces done, they're collecting all their evidence and they're getting their evidence uploaded to uh, the platform that uh, assist uh, that Advanced Ed has. And then November, uh, we're creating our presentations. Uh, we're, we, each standard at the committee, at each standard committee at the district level has to co uh, complete a presentation of that standard that kind of over, overviews their standard. Uh, and then also we have to create a superintendent's district overview that will talk about um, specifics as far as performance, demographics and some background. Now you'll probably notice the last time we went through advanced ed, it was all handled at the district level. There wasn't uh, a lot of school uh, work that was done. Well, it's different this time around. Uh, all the schools are doing everything that the district has been asked to do. Is that last date, the November? Supposed to be 16. Well, November, November 30th is, I put in November 30th so that at the, no, at the end of November, we were completely done. But it's supposed to be 2016, not 2017. Yes, it is. <laughs> so I do need to change those to 2016. Oh, okay. Tell them about that. Carl, was that a switch? Um, is that what Advance Ed wanted us to do by schools instead of the district? Is that the norm? Um, well, that's, that's what they're doing now, yes. Okay. This so round, cool. they've taken it not just at the district level like we did before, yeah. but also uh, at, the, um, uh, at the school level. I do apologize about, about those dates. It should be 15 and 16. I got a little ahead of myself. Um, but yes, uh, it is the norm with, with, all of the, uh, with all of the districts now with okay. that process. So the committees you're talking about, is one at each school? Is that how the committees? Well, the committees, they'll have five at each, they'll have seven committees at each school. At each school has They'll seven. have to do the, the five standards, oh. and then they'll have their diagnostic oh. performance, and they'll have their, um, which is uh, school performance on assessments, and then they'll have their um, survey performance. But it'll still be a district-wide district -wide accreditation, right? Not individual That's school That's correct. Yes, ma'am. It'll still be district-wide. And the idea is that the schools look at those, they find out where they're at, they do the self-assessment, and then the reason the schools are going first so that at the district level, we can uh, base a lot of our um, self-assessment of those standards on what the school said. I think you're doing a good job because I was at an LSC meeting last week and they already had a bunch of information and they were getting it out there to the LSC members, you know, about kind of what was going to happen and how it worked and the training. So. You've, you've got them geared up, which is a good thing. It seems like so much more than last time. Excuse it me? seems like so much more so than last time. Yeah, it's, a, it's much more involved than it was last time. Because again, last time it was just at the district, the district level. Now it's almost a, a mirror image of what the district has to do, but also at the, at the school level. Uh, then um, in January, we're just doing all of our final preparations. Uh, we'll have, uh, we'll present uh, uh, to cabinet and of course the Board of Education uh, what our overview will be in our standard summary so that we can take comments on anything that we need to change in preparation of the, uh, of the visit. <clears throat> We're then asking with that Elliott Review Professional Development, that's a piece that only the schools that are being visited uh, are going to re-deliver so that they're aware of that Elliot. And we're going to do a crosswalk between the TAPS and the Elliot so that they see the connections between those. Um, we, um, we, we believe, I believe that there will be about eight schools uh, that will be uh, visited. And the reason when I was on the external review, we had two people in charge of two schools uh, and there, there were eight people on the review so we saw a school in the morning and then a school in the afternoon uh, if they have more people on the uh, the review team then then they may visit more schools. but we'll know more about that once we sit down and we don't we don't know who the schools will be yet uh, and, until we have that sit down and that discussion about where we're at with advanced ed um, at the end of January, we'll ask that the schools uh, share that advanced debt accreditation information with their LSC, just some final pieces, uh, and then February 5th through the 8th, we'll be hosting 
from the external review team, uh, and then on the 8th, they'll have a, uh, a report uh, to present to the BOE on their findings. Questions or concerns? Well, I'm concerned because of all the hard work and all the extra work that the whole staff is going to be doing. I know we have to do this, but this is crazy. Well, well, yeah, maybe to their to their school improvement plan. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, they'll be able to get yeah, so the information they're using. Yeah, yeah. so like the, the, the great thing the about what we've been doing with GAPS is that we this we've been following not the same exact process, but right. that process. Similar. In, in our practice there with our gaps and then onto our many gaps. With our school improvement plans, we weave in those advanced ed standards so they see that what they're doing at the school level ties into those advanced ed standards and also uh, we'll be tying those into our strategic plan a, a, as well. So it, it's just one fluid thing. Um, it, as far as collecting the evidence, they already have a lot of evidence, mm -hmm. um, and they've been collecting that for gaps, and so they'll have those pieces and ready to go. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you know if any other systems of our size have gone through this new format yet? Well, we're the last round, so everybody, everybody you know, everybody in the state, um, you, we're the last round of it. So I don't know how many are going and finishing up next year, but after next year, they'll be changing the standards. Uh, and, and maybe the process as well, but, but we're that last round, so we're, everybody in the state uh, has been through this, uh, this new process. Okay. Well, well so you. if they can do it, we can. Oh, yeah. yeah. sure. Yeah, that's but we can do it better. That's right. Yeah. Always. Better. Honestly, <laughs> always. I love the many gaps. I think that is just such a yeah. wonderful program that we do in the schools. Just having participated in that one, it, you learn so much about a school. Yes, ma'am. And, and we're looking at how we can continue that, and it may not be uh, the gaps of what kind of what that looks like in the future, and, and, and making it kind of mesh more with the advanced ed uh, process, and then pro uh, probably incorporating the Elliott form as well to get that. You know, again, just to make it second nature and just part of what we we always do. We always try to take school improvement, and everything that we're asked to do. And just and, and blend it all together, make sure it's best practice, and that way it's just a present, uh, presentation of what we do great every day for kids. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, and now we have the strategic planning timeline with Jennifer Kratchelow. Okay. Another time. All time. All time. We're going to have a busy time. call. Yeah. Is it all ties together? Okay, so Carl just went through a bit of advanced ed for you. So what we did, Sandy and I sat down and went through your calendars for the next couple months, and we took the advanced ed dates along with the tr strategic plan dates, and then we also threw in the continuous improvement process so you can see how everything fits together for the district. So I'm not going to go over Carl's dates. You just did that, but the dates um, for you, oh, let me back up. I presented an update on the strategic plan at your board retreat. Since then, Dr. Bearden and I have met with Glissy and GSBA, and they're going to be our external facilitators for the process, which we're really excited. The board has a great relationship with GSBA. Um, Mr. Perkle's done a fantastic job with his leadership development with Glissy. So we're excited for them to come in, and they're excited for the opportunity to work with us, too. So here's the date. Um, we'll get together in August, and we'll do a one-day retreat. Oh, I'm, I'm bouncing ahead of myself. Okay. So in August, um, before we get together and do community feedback, we're going to launch, along with the online surveys for Advanced Ed, we're going to launch an online survey for our community. So the Advanced Ed survey will be two weeks. The Strategic Plan survey will be three weeks. And we feel if we partner together mm -hmm. and get the information out to the parents, and we'll be able to maximize the participation because the Advanced Ed surveys are for the schools. The Strategic Plan survey is for the district. Okay. And then as we're doing the survey, we're going to do two community engagement meetings. The first will be a large meeting at um, the Linear Tech Conference Center, and that will be similar to how we did the last strategic planning meeting that we had it upstairs in 350, 380, remember it was packed. And so we are expecting a lot more people this time. And so Glissy and GSBA will facilitate that process. And then we're also going to utilize the superintendent's advisory groups too. So be LSC, superintendent, parent and community advisory, and the teacher advisory. And then um, that same week, we're going to have a smaller group, and that will just be the, te the student advisory. So that will be middle and high school students. And then once we collect all of that feedback, and then we'll also have a notebook, too, that we'll put together that we'll work with Carl Mercer on to make sure we have all of the data that you need. We're going to have a one-day planning retreat, and that will be September 13th. 
at the conference center again, and that's when we will start our work on the strategic plan. We'll come back together in October, and that's when we'll, that's when we will finalize our strategic plan. And then we're going to turn around and go back um, to the admin. So after we have a strategic plan put together, we're going to take it to the admin meeting in November and get some final feedback from them, from them and then we'll bring it back to the board in um, December. So you'll have a finalized strategic plan prior to us going for district accreditation. So you can also see too how we wove in the continuous improvement process, which we have school, impro school improvement plans. And once those are built, then the departments then create their department improvement plans using that information. So we'll be able to incorporate that. Some changes that um, Carl Mercer and Fonda Harris and I have worked on too this year for the continuous improvement process is we're going to do a mid-year checkup. Right now, once they have the plans, they're continuously working on them, but we don't take those school plans back to cabinet and say these things have changed. And also cabinet members don't have the opportunity to say, here's some things we're working on in our department that have changed. So we're going to implement that a mid-year review in January. Um, we also are working with Rick Gunn in finance that we're going to incorporate what we do for our continuous improvement process into the budget cycle. So one of the things that Rick wants to do is actually move up the budget, budget cycle by a month. He said that that's really common for a lot of other districts in Metro Atlanta. So we're excited too as a cabinet that we'll be able to collaborate and talk about if we have additional budget requests and how that ties back into our um, department improvement plans and ultimately the strategic plan. We really liked what we did in um, February this year where the board and the school admin and the central office administrators all got together and had a collaborative conversation about the learner profile. So we're going to do that again this year. Um, Fonda, Har Fonda Harrison will present to you at the leadership retreat in June the revisions that we worked on from the learner profile. We just finalized that yesterday. Do we know the date of that yet? Do we know yet? the June date yet? For what? The, the June date for retreat? leadership retreat? Six and seven. And then um, for the budget, then we'll have a tentative budget in April 2017 and a final budget in May 2017. So I will start sending you calendar and invites for these so we can go ahead and reserve those dates on your calendar. But we wanted to give you a heads up before we start sending you calendar invites. The leadership retreat is June 6th and 7th, Monday and Tuesday. Yep. Okay, any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I was putting it in my calendar. <laughs> okay, it's not going to be a slow year. It is not going to be a slow year. No, no, no. It's slow year. Let me say it. Yes. We're on top of that. Mr. Perkle requested that we do some, but we denied that request. We denied that request. Okay, our action item for tonight is the uh, fiscal year 17 tentative budget with Rick Gunn again. He's just front and center tonight. Me again. Well, last week um, I brought you an initial budget presentation uh, to give you an idea of where we were at with the budget. Um, this week I come to you for tentative budget approval and uh, at the regular board, session, board meeting in June we would do final approval. Um, after this meeting I would run the ad in the newspaper for a week uh, to satisfy that requirement. I'll touch on a few of the highlights that we talked about last week. Uh, since fiscal year 2007 our student population has grown by almost 80%. Uh, for fiscal year 17, uh, we have a 3% budget built into this, uh, excuse me, a 3% uh, salary increase built into this budget, as well as a 2.5% step increase for all employees that are eligible. Um, we're opening two new schools next year, as everyone's aware of, and in fiscal year 16, the board increased the millage rate by one mil to 17.3 in an effort to uh, be able to fund the two new school openings as well as uh, increases in the future that we're going to have. I've had no changes since the presentation from last week uh, to revenue or to expense. Uh, so the revenue for the 
fiscal year 17 budget remains at 372.4 million, expenditures at 369.6 million, leaving an excess revenue of 2.8 million. It is projected that our ending fund balance at the end of fiscal year 17 will be 52.5 million. Which is exactly where we wanted to be, isn't it? Which is where we were targeted to be, yes ma'am. The only two slides, I'll tap through this rather quickly, the only two slides I added since the presentation last week was for debt service and for capital projects. It's going to take a moment for it to get there. These fancy things must have right, for me here. Running it kind of slow here. <laughs> Okay, uh, the two slides that I've added are for debt service. Uh, basically, debt service is based on uh, the current debt service payments that we have already amortizing over the, the term of the bonds. Um, you can see the, the beginning fund balance of July 1st of eight and a half million. We'll be adding, nine point, adding to that about 1.2 million, leaving us a balance of 9.7 million. Um, you can also see we have a transfer in from spouse four uh, that is to cover the portions that the spouse is required to cover uh, that will be paid out of debt service. And in capital projects, coming in from the side, uh, the total revenues for capital projects will be, of course, uh, some interest that we earned, uh, spouse sales tax, uh, the expenditures will be $114.6 million, uh, transfers outgoing to debt service, $32.3 million. And we'll have an ending fund balance at the end of 17 of 37.8 million. All right, that's the end of the, of the slides. Were there any questions on what was presented last week or since then? Yeah. Nope. Okay, I would recommend approval of the FY17 budget. Do I have a motion to approve the FY17 budget? So moved. Second. A motion by Ann and a second by Tom. Any discussion? No. I think we're still looking more, but it's, it was very clear. And well, thank you. Thank you. And you can always call me with questions or email me. I think y'all did a good job. It, it was very clear, and I know that, I don't know if everybody knows how our budget works, but y'all have the budget meetings and all, and mm -hmm. all that was done first, and I think I finally understand it. <laughs> Well, hopefully next year we'll be a little bit earlier than we were this time. That's a good idea, I yes. think, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then it's not rushing. Everybody has a little more Jumping time. through hoops at the end is never fun. Right. So. right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. No other discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Baird, we have points of information. Is there anything you need to... Uh, number one, you did a great job at the State of the Schools uh, this, this uh, afternoon at the conference center, so thank you for doing that. Uh, I do want to point out the thank for Scythe County News for helping us with that with our video. That was Fabulous very well video. received. We, we appreciate their assistance. Um, six more days left of school for our students. <laughs> They're getting a little bit excited, as you might imagine, and looking forward to our five graduations this year, where we will see several thousand students march across the stage. One of them very special to you, right, Ms. Morrison? Yeah, yeah, yeah so little, little tissues for me yeah. there this year. <laughs> so yeah, that's about it. We're getting geared up for all of our summer work. I know Mr. McKnight and his team, we've got a lot of stuff. We've got a lot of stuff going on now, but even more stuff that will start the, the first day school's out. So we're getting geared up for summer. That's it. Okay. Great. Do I have a motion to go into executive session for personnel? So moved. Second. A motion by Tom and a second by Kristen. All in favor? Unanimous.